Willpower is a tile-based game, which means the levels and worlds you explore are all pieced together like building blocks. This is to allow more flexibility in the game engine, and so that everything that's drawn can also be more flexible and reusable. But unfortunately, for the last couple of months, I've been dealing with an increasingly more severe problem. And that problem is blindness. Now I don't mean literally, thank goodness, but what I do mean is blindness to the bigger picture. I am unable to see anything that I am making in context of how it will be seen in the final product. I'm decorating levels and worlds that are merely a concept. They don't yet exist, and I have no confidence that any of these pieces will actually look any good once it all comes together in the end. But I have finally found a solution to this problem, and I would like to take you on the journey of how I got there. The idea was wanting to be able to quickly create mockups of levels in the animation software, so I wouldn't have to wait for the game engine to be ready, and also be confident that everything I feed into the game would get used. So first, I had to create a grid for all the tiles to slot into. Now, I use Toon Boom for just about everything, but probably its biggest drawback is a lack of snapping tools. There's no align and distribute to be able to just throw together a quick grid and have it be completely perfect. What it does have, however, is this. This is a field chart, and you'll notice that it's not perfectly square. So it's a bit of a workaround, but it works just as well, is that there is a method of snapping to make it attached to this grid. So I made a series of lines all the way down like that, copy and paste them and rotate them across 90 degrees. So that should be perfectly square. In some cases, it's still not completely perfect, at least not uh, within alignment to the canvas. You know, this line here is not gonna be at 0, 0.0, but any distance between these squares is probably only gonna be off by like 0. 0.0001 of a pixel. So I can live with that. Every tile that I create for the game fits within this square canvas here. This is what the camera is adjusting and exports it out at 1080 by 1080 pixels. I figure that's a fairly standard resolution. Why not? And the grid, when finished, is aligned to it. So it's quite big and you see that each square is perfectly the same size as the camera view tile. Above it, however, in the node editor, this is a scale peg here, it makes the whole thing smaller. So perfectly smaller that the entire grid itself will fit inside the grid of my square camera. You can see how small the field chart is now, so it does make quite a difference, but now I should theoretically be able to go about painting in levels. My first idea was to do this quite literally, to, to paint levels into existence. In Harmony 16, a stamp tool was introduced where you could load pieces of artwork into it and you know place down little pictures or even just draw with a texture in that way, I suppose. That seems like a decent solution. So I loaded up some tiles into one and tried to very carefully uh, stamp one at a time or even draw a stroke of level into existence. I could use things like the stroke tool and whatever and that, that would kind of work. It wouldn't always be perfectly lined up, but it would sort of get the idea across, but it's definitely quite crude. I could see what different tiles looked like next to each other but it was still quite a cumbersome process. Uh, loading everything into one of these stamp brushes was a bit of a hassle. It all had to be on one layer and it just had to be flat raw vectors. Many of the tiles didn't work that way. They had effects, they were quite complicated. The only way to flatten that complication was to export it into a PNG, then re-import it again. Unfortunately, the stamp brush doesn't work with bitmaps. It only works with these raw vectors. But this did get me by for a little while, until, Recently, I stumbled across a bunch of people that looked like they might be interested in seeing what this was all about. So I decided to whip up a, a new map. I've done plenty of them on paper before, but to draw one digitally was new. Not sure why I hadn't up until this point, but it was a good incentive. For the sake of demonstration, it was better to be less is more. Rather than painting with textures, this time I took the grid and using Toon Boom's Paint Unpainted tool, I could just paint inside any one of the tiles. In fact, because it's Paint Unpainted, I could do lasso chunks and lines, that, and it wouldn't affect what was already there. So this way I could effectively draw levels and maps into existence very quickly and easily. Upon that shape, I drew all of the mechanics, the features that a typical level is going to have. So for once, I wasn't thinking about graphics and texture, but rather just how the game will play. 
These were the mechanical details. Everything else left simple. To my surprise, this was highly motivating. And I couldn't wait to show it off and send it to lots of different people to get their feedback. And a lot of people responded with very similar questions. I was able to refine and improve it uh, so that those questions would just be answered by looking at it. Upon showing it to my coder, Lockie, however, he had an interesting response where he quite simply said, surprised you didn't try and make it with the assets you've done. To which I responded, this template can only do straight color. It's good for testing colors with each other, but not actual drawings. Um, so the next step would be to stamp in the assets on top of it. This is still the fastest way to experiment with level layouts and progression methods. So I'd like to do a bunch of these and then choose a couple of favorites to replace with the main art. But then I suddenly remembered a new feature that was put into Toon Boom in 16. I'd just seen the option in the menus where bitmap style layers can be automatically tiled. If I stack a bunch of tiled assets and have them set to be masked in according to certain tile painting layers, I then got very excited. So here is an imported single tile sitting nice and snugly within the square camera view. Over here, these are the two new buttons, tile horizontally, tile vertically. If I press tile horizontally, oh, look at that. It lines out just pretty dang far. And then pressing vertically. Now it's either going to just stack it in, in a single row or it's going to take all of these and stack all of them, which it does. So now there's this gigantic field, <laughs> the ridiculous amount of seamlessly stacked wall tiles. From here, if its position and scale is perfectly aligned with my painted grid, and I took a second layer that was duplicated tiles of floor, soil type thing, and I take my map shape here, if I were to mask this shape with the soil, I would get this. If the stacked walls are put underneath, look at that. So now I suddenly had a way of testing assets in an actual map format. Because I was just painting with individual pieces of white tile, by tracing new tracks in, as long as I had any color selected, it would look as if I was now painting levels directly into existence. And by simply erasing any tile would bring walls into existence. This was incredibly fast, but I wasn't ready to stop there. For you see, this still had a flaw. There was a downside to it. Having to export and then re-import any tile again uh, was, it was a bit tedious. Having to do that for every single thing I just wanted to test. What if I wanted to change something? I would then have to change it on the vector version, export it, re-import it again, and then put it back into the editor to see what would happen. Now, if there was a way to be able to make this type of thing with the actual raw vector art itself, then not only could I still paint maze shapes, but I could actually paint the tiles themselves live into the world. This is where the peg displacement machine comes into play. <laughs> this is a simple node structure. Light blue ones like this are all your drawing layers. They all come together into a composite and the display is what we see through the camera. Above it is where a peg would go. This is a positional data. It's where you can move a layer to anywhere around the field. Typically they go above, which means there can only be one. But this is where peg displacements come into play. These are a lot of fun because it lets you put the peg underneath it in the chain. And what that ultimately means is being able to have the same object exist in two places at the same time, like that. They're both sourced from the same image, so updating one in any way will affect both. So what if I moved both of these the same amount of distance to the left, but then daisy chained one off the other? See, it acts as a multiplier, applies the same amount of distance again, and you can keep this going. As you can see here, ha <laughs> ha So each one of these has a peg displacement, uh, which is shifted by negative 12, I think. Uh, yeah, there we go, 12 west, 12 west, 12 west, there we are. And they just keep going. Each one daisy chained off the last, so it just multiplies by itself. So the second one is like 24, the fourth one is 48, etc. All the way down until you get this great big row and this great big chain of events all coming off of each other like that. It is enormous and then all comes down into one great big composite and then out the bottom. Then it gets worse. All of that is grouped into one box here. 
And now I have a second chain, and these, as you probably would guess, uh, does the same thing going down uh, in increments of negative uh, 16 stacked up on top of each other. Now remember, uh, Toon Boom, it has a fill chart system, not a grid system, so <laughs> dimensions going up and down is actually different to left and right. 16 down is the same as 12 left and right, which is kind of weird to get used to, but that's fine. Uh, but now rather than duplicating and shifting individual squares, we are duplicating and shifting entire rows at a time. As you see, I'll move this display down, see how it sort of takes the row, puts it on one below, and it creates this ridiculous, uh, magnificent looking spine shape. And at the very bottom, all of those duplicates of rows stacked on top of each other makes this handy dandy grid of tiles. And all of these are connected back to the original source. Haha. <laughs> In this build, there are now two generators, one that has a complete set of walls and another one that has a complete set of floors. However, the floors are currently invisible. They are set up through a mask of the main painting grid, which of course means that as I start using my paint on painted tool to start drawing in tracks, I can start making bits of level and areas to explore, you know, maybe large rooms uh, with corridors to connect them. And hopefully I can remember exactly see the, where the tracks are. There we go. Yes, yes. All right. Yes, shapes. But not only this, because, again, these shapes connect to a single source. If I look at any one of them in the drawing view like this, performing any modification to them will update it for every single one on the entire grid. And this goes for the floor as well. Look at that. So with this system, I can modify, update, you know, I can unplug these and, and, and pop a different tile in, experiment with lots of different textures, update colors, parts of the drawings. But there is only one aspect remaining that I would really like this thing to have. And it is starting to push it. I very nearly didn't make this thing at all because I was quite convinced the computer wasn't going to be able to handle it. And it is starting to slow down, but it does work. So the next challenge is how many different types of tiles can this thing handle at the same time? Because consider everything needs to exist simultaneously. This floor set is being duplicated across the whole thing and the mask is simply subtracting the ones it doesn't want. But I'm pretty sure as far as the processing is concerned, it's still taking into account everything. So it's not ideal, but it does work. I need to keep this in mind though for each one I plug in, it's going to be putting in the full set. That's what each one of these plugs here is. And if I move inside this group, you can see what I've built is a whole bunch of distributor reactors, more or less. What this thing will let me do, when I'm working with this standard map here, I can start painting in with different colors. Over on the palette here, I've set up a whole bunch of different ones, walls, floors, decorations, etc. And what these colors do is isolate different tile types, different texture types, depending on what I want to have revealed. So over here inside this, each one of these, uh, I keep the replicators off unless I need one because they do slow the program down significantly. But the structure is there, ready for me to copy, paste, and just slot it in like that. But you can see each one of these here, wall, one, two, three, four, five, six, floor, one, two, three, four, five, six, they have their sort of colors set up. And those are color selectors. This is the new version of color override where it sort of does the opposite. You just choose the colors that you want to have revealed, which means this version is only going to take the pink out of this map and whatever texture is plugged into the other side is going to apply that texture to these squares in particular. So it means I can now choose textures by just choosing a different swatch and bring entire levels to life this way. Having a whole bunch of them is going to bog the computer down considerably though. So I need to be careful not to like binge this really. It is for testing purposes. I, you know, it means I can sort of paint in a colorful way here to sort of, uh, you know, get the shape right, then plug it into the textures that I've drawn to just, 
you know, to check it, to see that it's all good. Uh, and if any of the tiles need updating, then I can sort of isolate those out and then go in and tweak them, see it happen in context with everything else. It's wonderful. This changes my entire workflow. It means I can now start with level design first, which ideally is how it should have always been, uh, and now choose aesthetics to the design around it. Uh, and this has increased my workload considerably uh, now that I'm seeing more potential of, of decorations and shapes and worlds that can be crafted rather than just here's a brick wall, here's a soil floor. Now it can be rooms with that, ha that just have a bit more life to them, you know? The ideas just keep flooding in and I'm having so much fun with it. Unfortunately, the, the downside of this entire revelation, which uh, you may or may not have noticed, has caused uh, video output on this channel to go down considerably. At the end of last year, I've, I feel like I was doing quite well. Uh, when I brought this channel back, I was doing two videos a day. And then after that proved to be quite intense, I brought it down to one a day. And then usually it's like every other day. And then by Christmas time, I had a whole like week's worth set up ready to go so that if I went away on holidays, it could sort of keep going and then be ready for when I got back. But I didn't finish everything in time. Uh, so I just sort of became content with the fact that there would be a week without videos. And then upon getting back, uh, I, I was already out of the habit and, and making new videos just sort of didn't happen. It was an important realization because uh, I guess I started to realize that dividing my time is somewhat difficult. Towards the end of last year, working on this game had taken a bit of a backseat in favor of always needing to get the next video out. So the grind of having to keep up with the video every day and then neglecting the whole reason why I'm going solo at the moment to, to make this game uh, seemed a bit counterproductive. So throughout January, I focused almost entirely on the game and that was amazing. I made so much progress, it was nuts, uh, but there was very little room to even be thinking about channel work at all. So with this, I'm hoping to try and find an appropriate balance. And if you have thoughts, queries or suggestions, of course, I'd love to hear them. These videos are for you after all, if they're not helping in some way, particularly like the animation tutorial stuff, then why am I here? So I'm always open to new ways that uh, you can help me to help you. Yeah. Tune in for the next Willpower Recap. I'll take you on a crazy compositing journey. If you want to know more about Toon Boom Nodes and how all of its wonderful filters and glowing effects and things all come together, oh boy, this is... <laughs> come see it.